So turn to uh, James chapter 4 and verse 17. And we're going to uh, talk to you about how you can change your world. And I think everybody in here is going to be able to participate in what I'm going to suggest. So I want you to be uh, listening and thinking. And, and then I want you to maybe, you know, maybe you want to brainstorm with me or someone about how you can do what I'm going to suggest to you to do today. So uh, James chapter 4, if you're there, it says, Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. I sprayed for bugs this week. Woohoo! I sprayed for bugs. It was cut. Well, the bugs just, they were bugging me. And um, the West Hall was empty. There's a hallway along the west side of our building in the old section. And we emptied that whole thing so that Lisa could do some things with the kids. And um, so since it was already empty uh, and the kids' overnighter stuff was moved out, I thought I will spray for bugs. And then, you know, while I'm at it, I sprayed for bugs everywhere. So all over the building, I tried to find, you know, outside perimeter walls. And I went on the outside of the building and sprayed. And I went on the inside of the building and sprayed. And uh, hopefully it'll help cut down on the bugs. Yay! Because I knew to do good. And if I didn't do it, it would be sin. You're going to be like, is that really what the message is about today? Kind of. Um, but I wanted to take advantage of the fact that the hallway was already cleared out. And I had to move all those pew chair things anyway and um and lisa had done this thing in the hallway you should have seen it 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 was and she's got pictures so she can show it to you she did this thing in the hallway with the kids and um and you know she did such a good job with the kids and with the fundraiser and now we're raising some more funds to try to get the carpets in children's church and some of the other rooms cleaned up because they really need it and it's on my to-do list to test some stuff that I got to see whether it'll get some spots up and so we've been working on all this different stuff and um, Lisa why don't you come up now and tell them what a little bit about what you did at the overnighter because she just did a fabulous job um, you got anybody to yeah, look at that. They're, they're fighting over who's going to... She's got a she's got her grandbaby with her today. And so there's this, there's this large desire from several people to get a chance to work with a baby. So, yeah, tell them a little bit about our, our overnighter this year. They don't get that excited to hold me. Yeah. <laughs> um, you don't so, fit on, your, on their lap as well as you used to when you were that size. Um, so... Um, <laughs> We had um, 15 kids. Um, it went so well. Um, everybody, we got a lot done this year, which means that they were listening. They had their listening ears on, and they did really good. Um, what? <laughs> I feel like I was just put in a box. You were. So, um, yeah. What did you want me to the tell The TV them? box. Well, just tell them what you did oh. in the hall. That's the oh, in the hall. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> see, we did all that other work, and he just wants to talk. We did. You um, can tell him whatever you want, but okay. Testify. So we did a black light hallway um, with the um, with fish all over the wall, and um, it was really cool because when we went in there, um, we sat down and we did a little talk about God, and the kids were like. Um, there are no fish that glow like that. That's not real. And my grandson said, yes, it is. It's called bioluminescence. And fish in the deep, deep oceans have bioluminescence. And he, like, started telling them all this stuff about bioluminescent fish. And how old is he? Um, he's six. And I was like, yes. I said, what's really cool about that is that even when we, I said, James, what happens if you go down into the deepest, deepest, deepest? He says, well, it can crush you. He said, but we are starting to where we can go down a little deeper in the waters, and we figured out how to get past being crushed if we go down too deep. And I was like, that is so cool. I said, you know, it's kind of neat that even before we could go as deep as we can now, and even deeper than what we can go now, 
God has put in fish something to make them beautiful so that we could enjoy looking at them. So cool, right? Like God plans ahead. So we talked about that lesson while we were in there, and it, it turned into a great teaching moment, which I love to just grab those times. You know, the Bible says that we're supposed to be ready in and in out, of, out of season, and we're supposed to teach our kids while we walk and while we talk and while we do everything that we do. And that turned into one of those moments, and I was like, yay. So we, we just had a really good time. Um, yeah. Can I thank everybody now? I just wanted to get to that. <laughs> so um, we had a great turnout of helpers this year. Um, I really, really wanted to thank everybody that donated, everybody that um, just blew me away with your donations. Um, so Wanda, where are you? Wanda was out there every single day. Some days she was there before me. You know, every single day, Wanda was out there, and even though she was in pain, she continued to just do stuff for me. Um, Beth Bachman was out there. She did some of the glow paint, glow fish painting, and some of the little um, oh, that's those stupid fish that we had to put together. Um, on the string and cut out. Oh, that was annoying. Um, Betty was there. She helped paint some of the stuff in the hallway. These girls didn't even know they could paint. Look, they could paint. And the hallway came out so cool. Um, Joyce Stanton was there overnight. It's so nice to have a third shifter <laughs> when you have an overnighter because the little five minutes that I get to doze off, and she said I snore on my side. That's great to know. So Joyce was awake the whole time, and that is just, it helps me to feel safer in case I do knock out, you know? So um, Sue Feeney came down, and she helped us a little bit. Um, Joan O'Brien, she ran errands for me and came down and helped us with those little tiny fish. Yeah. Um, Aiden was there. He is the staple gun king. Oh my goodness, getting those staples out of the hallway. I think I left a few. But oh my goodness, he was, he, it was so funny. I got to tell you this because all of the little prank stuff that was in that hallway, like we had this one fish that um, had some like areas where it looked like it was bit out of. They put a baby shark biting it. Like, I know that sounds morbid, but it was hilarious to me. They had a, there were a couple um, tur tortoises that were high-fiving. I mean, just, like, they just put some cute little fun things in there, which was awesome. Um, Colvin came down, and he helped us, too. Um, he, <laughs> he liked the splatter painting. They all like splatter painting stuff, so we're going to have to do that sometime in youth, do some splatter painting stuff. Um, Julia Souls, she's my best friend from high school. Um, she, she used to do VBSs at her church, and she gave us the stuff that was in the hallway, the cardboard cutout stuff that we repainted. She gave us all of that. She gave us some um, trees. She, just, she came out and helped me put stuff together, which gave us another layer of fun that I don't think we had in the past. So if you thought this year was more... was kind of crazy, better than last year. It's because of Julie. It's a Julie thing. Julie's are my favorite. Right, Julie? <laughs> um, Lisa Hacker came out. She helped. Tim vacuumed and helped. He hung up my high stuff and popped my scuba guy. I didn't pop it. <laughs> <laughs> His tube did, did stay on until we were done, though. Yeah. So that's the good thing. Um, Matt, my husband, actually came out, and he did some heavy lifting. My mom and dad came out and helped. Shirley stopped in, and she helped, too, and she let me use her beautiful blankets, which if she can't find them after church, I don't know where they went. Just saying. And Mike actually helped a little bit. He came in every day and teased us and brought us a little food. So, yeah. Yes. Who'd I forget? Oh, yeah. Mallory came in. Mallory was our squishy shoe this year. So she filled in for us. She, it was really good. She did a good job. Um, yeah. <laughs> she, she was um, Flipper. Flipper was her name. So, okay. Good. All Thank right. you.
perfect. That went crazy. It's all right. I took half your time. It's all right. <laughs> and no, you didn't, because I don't have a time limit. <laughs> so you see all these different people who we are testifying were a blessing to our church this week. I think we should just give the Lord a praise for those people and them a round of applause. Can we do that? Yay, God. So it was a great overnighter, and then it was a great opportunity after the overnighter because I needed to spray for bugs. And you're probably wondering, what's the bug thing about? It's really not, not a big deal. Um, but I'm a doer, and a lot of you are doers. I think it's important to try to do things, get things done. And um, I, like, I like checklists. I like to get my things off my checklists. Although my wife laughs because I say I like checklists, but then I forget to look at my checklist. And, you know, I'll, I'll go to the store <laughs> with this thing that I know I need to do. Like my, my son, I bought a few things at Home Depot for him at his house in Auburn. And then we decided not to use them. And then for a month... I kept forgetting I would be over there and I would go to Home Depot to get something else and I would forget to take in the other thing, you know. It's like, it's, I, I'm not saying I'm perfect on checklists at all. But, but when I do go down my checklist and I get things done, I feel good. How many of you are like that? You feel good. I, I like to, when I get things done, it just makes me feel like, oh, I've accomplished something. I, I like to feel like I get to the end of the day. And, and, and that, by the way, also fulfills another scripture, James 1.22, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. I think doers are okay. I, th I think it's a good thing. And anyway, I usually have nice big lists of things. And, um, and this last week, I got a lot done for the church. I also, I also had a honeydew list. I got some things done around the house that my wife wanted me to do. I have got a list that's bigger than I can handle around the house probably as well. And I've got a big list here. And I was really happy too. I think I finally found the hole that was leaking water over here. Some of you may not even have noticed it. A lot of people don't even look up and see it, but there are little stains in the ceiling. And I had this whole thing that I had to do up on the roof to try to solve that problem. And I found, I, I did it and I still had a leak. And I think I finally found that one specific leak. So, you know, it's really great to get things done. If you're a doer, by the way, and you're looking for something to do, I have things to do here at the church for you. And um, maybe you're not a person who likes to be told what to do, which is fine. Look around and find something and you can tell me what you want to do. Like, like maybe, I don't know whether some of you have noticed, some of our pews have little spots, stains that could be cleaned up. And if you, if you want to clean a pew, of these little two-person seats, you can do the one near you. You can just pick the one near you. You don't even have to do all of them. Just say, I want to come. There's one that's bugging me, Pastor Tim. Every time I come in, I see this spot. And it's like, ah. Uh. So, yeah, I'll let you clean that one. I'll even show you how. I'll even bring the equipment in to help you do it. So while I was on my way to church on Thursday to spray for bugs, all of that was to get to this. While I was on my way to church on Thursday, I was coming down Baltimore Street, and there's a guy, and he's walking the opposite way of me. I'm coming toward the church. He's going toward town, and he's got his thumb out. And I go past him, and three cars are coming this way, and I realize, oh, none of them stopped. And I'm thinking... To him who knows to do good and does not do it, it is sin. Now, I want to remind you, sin is missing the mark, and all of us miss the mark probably at least, you know, once a day, as far as depending on how accurate you require yourself to be and hitting the mark. I mean, there's the mark, and then there's the, you know, there's the big target, and then there's things and rings inside the target, then there's the bullseye, and... I'm like, but Lord, I want to get bug sprayed. I've been planning to spray bugs. This is my bug spraying day. It's on my list of to-dos. And then I found myself turning around, and I go up, and nobody's behind me, so I just, right on the road, just pull right up and stop, roll the window down, says, can I take you somewhere? And he's like, yes. And he gets in, 
And um, when I asked him where he needed to go, because I said, where do, where do you need to go? He says, I need, need to go out by GM plant, out by the path center, no CAC. You know where that is? I said, yep, I know right where that is. And so off we headed that direction. And then he said, when he was done out there, he had to get out there. He was not sure he was even going to make it in time because he was walking and he got tied up. And, and so then it was like, well, how, uh, I'll take you out there. You have to go. He says, yeah, I have to go back to the bike shop in town and pick up my tricycle. Have you seen those big tricycles that some people have? He's got one of those. And that was when I remembered, oh, I think I've seen him before going down this road on his tricycle. So I told him I was Tim. I didn't tell him I was the pastor here. I asked him his name, and I'm not going to tell you his name. I'm just going to call him Mr. T. He had a name that started with a T also. The scripture, by the way, says when we do our charitable acts, our alms, you know, we don't want to make a big deal about it. And some people wonder why the scripture says that. Well, you don't want to basically say to everybody, look at this person who had a need and you exploit their need to make yourself feel better or look better. I wasn't trying to exploit anything and I'm not trying to exploit anything now. Uh, just in case Mr. T would ever see this video, um, I don't want him to feel awkward or anything like that. And I'm not telling you this story, by the way, so I can get a pat on the back or feel good about myself or whatever. Um, I'm, I'm doing it as, an, as part of an illustration of what I want to talk about today. And in fact, I'm a little embarrassed to admit that um, I was rather resistant to picking him up. But I was, honestly. I, I was like, dang it, I don't have time for this right now. I got my plans for that. Anybody besides me ever do that? I'm, it's, yeah. Nobody but me. Okay. <laughs> I did tell him that I had been on my way to Bethel Church to spray for bugs. And I told him that I felt like the Lord said I should turn around and give him a ride. So, you know, he was actually very happy about that. And as we rode along, he, um, believe it or not, he, uh, he talked more than me. Yeah, I, I thought I would just let that sink in a little while. That's, uh, that's quite amazing. I won't tell you all that he told me, but he did communicate to me that he'd had a, I don't know, a, a little messy life. Well, welcome to the club. <laughs> you know, a lot of people have messy lives. I, I, everything in my life hasn't been, you know, easy. But he also wasn't a complainer. Let me just say that. He wasn't a complainer. And he, and he had a walking stick that was actually an old, old axe handle. No axe head on it. And, and he almost seemed proud of his, of his walking stick. It didn't really have a handle on it. I've been thinking maybe I need to find a, a nice, you know, stick with a handle maybe that would be nice for him to have. And if I can figure out where he lives, maybe I can get one to him. But he was kind of proud of his axe handle. And I know he needed healing because he was limping and he had an axe handle. You know, he had a, a thing to help him walk. But it was funny because as our conversation went, and I, and I, I literally did let him, let him talk. We were having, he, he seemed like he was having a good time, and, and, and praying for that just didn't come up. I probably should have asked him if, if there was anything I could pray for before he got out of the car, and for some reason, again, it, it just didn't happen. And so, other than the the fact that he talked more than me, no other miracle actually took place. <laughs> so that was on Thursday, and um, it was busy Friday doing some things, and then Saturday, going Friday night, you know, you go to bed, and Saturday morning about 3 a.m., I woke up, and I was thinking about Mr. T. And I was thinking in particular about the question of whether or not I missed it when I didn't pray for him. Did I miss it? And, and I may have. Um, I'm not saying I didn't miss it. I probably should have got there quicker. Um, and as I laid there, I said, Lord, nothing miraculous happened. And the Lord responded and he said, oh yeah, how do you know? Uh, 
Oh. Yeah. Just because I didn't see something miraculous happen didn't mean God didn't do something miraculous. Just because, you know, the sky did not part and lightning came down and a dove like a, you know, and a flame of fire lit on our heads. You know, not always like that. Miracles don't always need to be earth-shaking events. Some miracles are just the little things that change the course of someone's life. Some may even be little things that are part of other little things that accumulate and become, you know, something supernatural and transformational, but we're not there when it happens. So some of the things that people did to help out for the children's overnighter may have miraculous implications that we haven't even begun to comprehend. The little things that, that, that people did that, you know, they just wanted to help. And they got to help. And it's glorious that they got to help. And it's, and it's glorious that we were able to testify about it. And, and then on top of everything else, it's possible that my picking up Mr. T wasn't about Mr. T at all. Hmm. Maybe God was just checking to see if I was listening. And buying you more time to clean the hallway. No, because it was already cleaned at that point. It was, it was done. I was just, that was why I was rushing to get out here. I was... Because you had already gotten it clean, and I thought, I'm not going to let it go by a couple of days. I want to get this done. I've got things to do, you know. And, and maybe it was more about just me having God do a check on me. Hmm. There's a guy named Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and he was a Lutheran pastor in Germany during World War II, and he was part of the Hitler resistance, and um, he resisted the German euthanasia program which a lot of people don't realize even existed because we we pay more attention to the persecution of the Jewish people and he resisted that as well um, he wrote a book called the cost of discipleship and some people consider it a modern classic uh, on discipleship and he lived that cost of discipleship title out because he eventually was to meet his end in a concentration camp at the end of the war, just days before Germany gave up. Which makes me ask myself sometimes, what's our cost of discipleship? Like the cost of discipleship for me was I had to turn around and pick somebody up. <laughs> he also wrote another book called Life Together, the classic exploration of Christian community. Um, here's a little quote. We must be ready to allow ourselves to be interrupted by God. God will be constantly crossing our paths and canceling our plans by sending us people with claims and petitions. I, I don't know where I picked that quote up because I've not read the book that it came out of. And I, I know I picked that quote up because I've never been able to forget it. <sighs> but I also remember somebody who used it said something like this. This is the cross in our everyday life. It's when our crosses, when our will crosses with his will, and we bear that cross by changing our plans. You know, Jesus said, if you want to come after me, take up your cross and follow me. But I don't know very many Christians or even of very many Christians historically when you compare that to the vast number of people who are believers who have had to carry a cross or take up a real wooden cross. But yet we all have our metaphoric cross to bear. And sometimes... We bear our cross when what we were going to do doesn't work out the way we thought we were going to do it. And something else comes in and it changes everything. Although, 
it didn't change everything for me because I still got out here and got the thing done. I wasn't sure because when, you know, you're making your plans and you've got your day planned out and then all of a sudden you're doing something different, that, that can take you away from everything. So I, I took Mr. T to NOCAC and then to the bike shop because that was easy. It was on my way back to the church anyway and he thanked me and that was pretty much that. Was pretty much that. You know, that was it. During our conversation, he did say that he felt like I was sent by God. And that's cool. I'm, I'm glad I picked him up. I'm glad I still got the spraying done. And um, so it really didn't, wasn't that much of a cross to bear, was it? It wasn't a very hard thing. Hebrews 13, 2 says, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. I, I don't think that Mr. T was probably an angel, based on some of the things he told me. He wasn't an angel most of his life. Most of us haven't been. I, I, I did think of this verse also, though. Matthew 25, 40. And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. That scripture has come up a lot, it seems like, in the last couple of years. And I, I just, I just want to I just want to be there to do things as unto the Lord. So what I did was at least the fulfillment of that last scripture that I just read. And, and it, it's worthy of this if you will, testimony that I've been sharing with you today. So when I woke up on Saturday morning, I had this other phrase going through my head as I was thinking about all this. And it was one of those days, you know, you wake up and then you lay there and something comes to your head and then you just start thinking of other things. By the way, I, I encourage you, if, if you find yourself doing that, um, you know, fear not. Uh, take advantage of the opportunity in the middle of the night. Uh, it's, it, it, some of you remember I talked about sleep last year. It really isn't a bad thing to have a little like break sometimes. So relax and think to yourself, uh, you know, I'm not desperate here. I'll just, I'll just let this process go on. And if you can, write something down, which is what I decided I would need to do, which is funny because it's happened to me the last two weeks. I've, I've woke up with something in kind of in my head and, and uh, I needed to write it down. I told you that last week, and that was part of the message last week. So before I could forget, I grabbed my phone, and I did my two thumbs on the phone thing. And here's what I wrote down. When I see the power of God working in you, it grows the power of God working in me. When I see the power of God working in you, it grows the power of God working in me. I think the opposite when you see the power of God working in me, it grows the power of God working in you. This church has been big on testimonies for a long time. And I, 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 I don't know for sure. I tried to look back. It's been more than a year since I spoke specifically about the testimony. And I'm not speaking specifically about the testimony today. And yet, I wanted to come back to that and all of this because I think we need to take our value for the testimony to another level. I think God wants all of us and, and all of you watching and anybody who will stumble across this maybe on, on Facebook later or, or YouTube or will see it on TV in town. I think, it's, I think it's important for us to value the testimony, and I, I don't know that we've reached the value that we should have for it yet. And I think God wants us to reach higher, higher, higher and higher levels of value for our testimonies. Testimonies aren't just something that we do to give glory to God. But if that were all they did, would it not be enough? Would it not be worthy of us going after the testimony even more if testimonies gave glory to God and that's all they did? But what I'm suggesting today is that God gave us the testimony not as much for his sake as he did for our sake. He gave us the testimony for our sake. 
for our benefit. Testimonies inspire. Is there anyone here who wouldn't have done, don't answer this one. Is there, don't raise your hand. Is there anyone here that wouldn't have done what I did on Saturday? I'm only saying it as a rhetorical question. I'm not saying that you need to pick up every hitchhiker you see, and some of you probably wouldn't have been wise to pick up a hitchhiker, a, a lady picking up a gentleman who you might feel was bigger or stronger than you, don't want you to put yourself in a position of danger. But yet, if you felt safe, I think most people, if they were in that situation and they felt they could, they could safely do something, they would, they would love to help somebody like Mr. T out. Mr. T was obviously an older gentleman. You didn't know that until probably just now, but I knew it. Though it turned out, by the way, he wasn't older than me. I don't like the fact that I'm an older gentleman sometimes, but I am. Not quite retirement age. But when I get to retirement age, and I'm officially retirement age, I'm coming for you retired people. Because we, we have opportunities if we'll go after them, even at our older place in life, to do amazing things. Even though they may seem not that big a deal they are possibly a big deal to God and we need to be careful that we not think I don't need to this, do this because it's no big deal if I'm not going to raise somebody from the dead I'm just not going to worry about it <laughs> that's a dumb idea you know even if he had just had to go downtown only just to get his trike it would have been a long walk from where I picked him up but this message today is not as much about my experience as it is about God using my experiences and your experiences, not only to meet the needs of others, but also to transform each of us as individuals. So yes, it's important to meet the needs of others, and yes, it's important to glorify God, but what about the transformation of others because of my testimony that now can affect you or your testimony that can affect me and we can start to see opportunities and we can start to feel the spirit nudging us and we can start to find ourselves being doers and not just hearers of the word. What has happened to you lately that God can use to help other believers become stronger believers? Now, you may think the answer is nothing, by the way. I said that, and you may, ah, you know, nothing really going on with me. But I doubt that you are correct. I do sincerely doubt that you are correct in that. Every time God is involved in our lives, and he is involved in all of our lives in this room every day, and every time he's involved in our lives, even in the littlest things, it has the potential to be effective in touching others. So again, the phrase that woke me up was, when I see the power of God working in you, it grows the power of God working in me. God wastes nothing, you know. Your testimonies, no matter how insignificant they may seem to you, sometimes can be used by God to strengthen the rest of us. Just the littlest thing. You know, if I'd gotten up and given a testimony about how, you know, I stopped and picked the man up and we talked a moment and then I prayed for him and then, you know, he threw his axe handle out the window and we stopped the car and then he raced me and outran my car. That would have been pretty cool. But that's not what happened. God wants to strengthen the rest of us, and that is part 
of what God wants to accomplish when we give our testimonies. And sometimes we're hesitant to give our testimonies because we don't think they're a big deal, but they might be a big deal for somebody. And a cumulative group of testimonies might be a big deal for a lot of people. Yes, it glorifies God, but it also stirs us up. It inspires us and it moves us forward. Testimonies give us, it's a really big word, testimonies give us hope. And by the way, I just let's say this too as an education on how to give a testimony. If you get up and you share something that isn't full of hope, it's probably not a testimony. It's probably just a story about a test that is a moany. Oh. As we are filled with hope, though, as we encourage one another and we become filled with hope, we become infected with hope and we become carriers of it. And by the way, that fits really well in the season that we're in, but I've said this for years. I've talked about being infected with hope times in the past. There's never been a time, though, that I can think of in my history or the history of probably anybody in this room or probably anybody who will listen to this message. There's never been a time in history when hope was needed more than we need it today. We need hope to go viral. Right? Wouldn't it be great if hope started going viral? Like if the confident expectation of good, which is what hope is, what if that started going viral in the midst of this viral time? Now, all of you who have been around a while know that I like to talk about our church being the opposite of the NFL. The NFL, they practice all week and they play on Sundays. And I've said this for years. We come in and we practice on Sunday and then we go out and play all week. That's the job. So when we call for testimonies, it's important that you share your testimony if you have one. And sometimes when I call for testimonies, there are people who, they just, they go blank. Any, anybody, anybody relate to that? Some of you can relate to that. I could probably point some of you out because... Uh, maybe you can't think of anything on the spur of the moment. Maybe you're one of those people when challenged, that's tough. But I have had a lot of people come up to me after the service. Do not do this today. <clears throat> Pay attention right now, okay? Don't do this today. And they say, when you asked, I couldn't think of anything. But then later I remembered and then they tell me a testimony. Yeah, testimony, anxiety, a little, little nervousness about actually, well, you know, if, if, if you do have a testimony after church today, don't come after we've asked for testimonies, which you know we're going to do here in a little bit, right? You can tell this is I'm leading up to something. Don't come up afterwards and, and, you know, say, oh, I just thought of that. You know, here's what I want you to do with it. Because you're like, I can sneak it in now and feel good about myself because I should have. Write it down and bring it with you next week. And if somehow we forget to take testimonies next week, the week after or the week after that, sooner or later, we're going to have testimonies. It's what we do in this church, right? Very rarely do we go more than like one week where we forget. We do it almost every week. And don't devalue your testimony. Don't think, well, this thing is, is just not important enough. It's not valuable enough. It's not, a, it's not a big deal. I'm not looking for big deals. I'm looking for anything that glorifies God and encourages others. And, and, you know, you had that little moment. And by the way, confession is good too. So I started out, we did this last week too. I had a confession, I had a confession. My confession was, at first, I didn't want to go turn around. I almost missed it. Confession. I maybe should have asked him before he got out of the car. Is there anything I can pray for you for? I missed it. It's okay. That's how we grow together. That's how we get motivated. And what happens is maybe one time you do something and, and you kind of got it, but kind of didn't. And somebody else has a very similar opportunity later in the same week or the next week. I mean, and, and all of a sudden they're like, hey, I'm going to go for it. 
And they come back the next week and say, you know, Billy Bob told us about blah, blah last week. And then I had blah, blah happen to me. And guess what I did? I jumped on it with both feet. It was so cool. So encouraging. And maybe you have a hard time getting in front of people and sharing a testimony. I get that. And I'm not trying to put you down or make you feel bad or anything else. I'm just trying to encourage you. Because think with me a moment. If you can't share your testimony in this setting where people are going to smile at you and be very happy and want to hear what you've got to say and want to glorify God with you, if this is a hard place for you to do it in, how much harder is it to do it out there? Because this is where we practice and out there is where we play. Because I'd like to suggest that the more we practice here and the better we get at it here, the easier it is to remember testimonies and live the testimonies and have the testimonies as part of our, our experience and we've shared our testimonies and we've even heard about others and had this or that happen and we can talk about it and then we get out there and then we run into a situation and then the testimony comes out and it becomes a life-giving thing in that situation because we practiced it here. Is this making sense to anybody but me? Yeah. And then one more thing I would like to suggest. If you don't have a testimony, I want to encourage you to go get one. Go get one. Go find your Mr. T. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Don't deceive yourselves. Be doers of the word, not hearers only. If you know to do something good and you don't do it, you're going to miss the mark. I'm not saying you're going to go to hell because you didn't give a testimony one Sunday morning about a hangnail that got better all of a sudden. But your hangnail testimony might help somebody. You never know. It could become a bigger deal than the little deal that you thought it was. Because somehow it might grow. How many remember? We, we aren't as agricultural as we used to be. But usually it's just one little seed that turns into a big plant. It grows. So we plant the seeds. And God grows it. If you and I, if all of us, can find ourselves being doers of the word and not hearers only, if all of us can see that we've got opportunities and to do good, and if all of us can bear our cross where our plans get crossed up with something else, and, and instead of whining and complaining about it or being ugly about it, we just go ahead and do it and give God glory, and then we testify because God got glory out of it. And I think that's how you can change your world. And you can't change the whole world, perhaps. I know there probably isn't anybody in here who wouldn't love to be able to just wave their hand over something. And, you know, the pandemic would disappear. Or they want to be like Elijah or Elisha. The guy came to him. Which one was it? Elijah or Elisha? That, that, that's seven ducks in a muddy river. So, <laughs> a lot of preachers have preached that. My wife's going, you're the, I'm getting them mixed up. I think it's Elisha. Because the guy came and he wanted to, the, the heathen man came with his leprosy and he wanted to be healed. And he came to the prophet and the prophet said, go dip yourself in the river seven times. He's like, the Jordan's a dirty stream. And I don't, that's dumb. He, he thought, he, I thought he would at least come out and wave his hand over my leprosy and it would disappear. Uh, we, we, we have all these ideas of what something should look like. We don't know what it should look like. Let's just face it. God wants to do stuff that, that we haven't even thought of. And when we begin to change our world, then we begin to change the world. There were 12 guys that followed Jesus. One abandoned him, but the other 11 changed the world. They started changing their world and it ended up changing the whole world. 
So, maybe it was a little bit of a rant. But this morning, as our musicians begin to get themselves ready, I'd like to take a few testimonies. So Mark's going to come up here, and he's going to handle some stuff. Now, we're going to leave the camera on for a few testimonies. And, uh, um, and then when we get a couple of testimonies, three or four or five or six, or if everybody wants to testify, we'll just put our instruments down and we'll testify. Okay. Does anyone have any testimonies that they want to share with us about anything marvelous that happened this week or last week? Or... Well, the ladies are coming up. Um, we had a, a marvelous thing happen while we were on vacation. Melissa and I stopped in Nashville, well, Franklin, which is south of Nashville, to visit a friend of hers that she's had since they were in high school, very, very young. And um, she and her husband live in a, in a beautiful neighborhood in Franklin. He is a, a Hollywood movie director, but they did not want to bring their kids up in Hollywood among that influence, so they moved to Tennessee. And he still, still directs, and, and they have all kinds of things in their house. He's got a theater room in there. We watched a movie in there, and he's got all of his editing equipment and everything. He's got his board up for the next screenplay that he's doing and all that stuff. Well, he also has, a, the, they, when they bought the house, in the house there was a saloon. And in the saloon was karaoke equipment. So he, he said, we'll buy the house, but we're taking everything. We want, we want all the stuff to stay. So we went down. He knew that Melissa and I were singers, and his wife is a singer. So he says, you guys are all going to entertain me now. We're going to go down the saloon. I'm going to turn on the karaoke stuff, and you're going to go and sing. And lo and behold, as the night wore on, we found ourselves singing praise and worship songs. And it was wonderful. That all of us were just up there singing our hearts out to God in the middle of a basement in Nashville, Tennessee. So I thought that was pretty cool. Marlene? Well, you know, I work part-time at Hawks, and a week ago Saturday, this young man comes in, and he's been in a couple times, 24, slight build, and, and he will talk your ear off. <laughs> Bless his heart. Um, it happens a lot, yeah, and I'm always looking for an in, you know, for, to pray for him, and it, nothing was coming. Towards the end there, he's telling me about how, you know, he walks everywhere. He's not able to drive, and his, his hips are in pain. I said, oh, all right, and uh, so I said, you know, he's carrying on about a conversation, and then I said, hey, can I pray for you? And he was kind of startled. I said, he goes, well, Okay. So I walk around, and I pray for him, and he's starting to walk away, still a little, like, not sure. And then he turns around and says, when are you here again? <laughs> and I thought, yes, here we go. <laughs> That's wonderful. Mine's short and sweet. I got a new job this week, and I got a new car. Wow. <laughs> nice. Nice. Come on in, Julie. Yesterday, I got a chance to um, prophesy over a couple of people from work. Oh, um, cool. I was at home uh, listening to music because I was getting stuff done. And all of a sudden, I heard God say, um, I want you to sing over this one friend from work. And um, I was thinking, OK, I'm going to do this at work. And he's like, no, 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 right now, I just want you to sing over her like I do. So I sang a couple of songs and worshiped. And um, then I sent her a text. And I have had a chance to pray for her before and um, give her a word here or there. So it wasn't too terribly stretching. Um, of course, she was very appreciative. And then a little while later, I heard another song, and it really struck me. And I thought about this one nurse practitioner that we have. Um, even though I'm clerical, I'm not directly over these people or don't directly have one of them over me, um, they're still my bosses. So this was a little bit of a stretch. Um, I don't have a personal relationship with her or anything like that. Um, but I sent her a message, and um, she was just real appreciative um, that I gave her that word. Yay. Wonderful. Yeah, good. Oh, we have a, okay. Hi. Come on in. You might get tired of me talking. 
Um, as everybody knows, I hope, um, that I work with special needs. And back in March, I had an emergency drop-in in in my house. And um, this individual of mine was um, a blessing to me. Um, He come at the right time for me. And I come for the right time for him. Um, It is now um, August. And he has worked hard. I have worked hard with him. Um, Everybody that I worked with wants to praise me for how far my individual has come. And the other day, one of my coworkers says, I want to praise you for all the work that you have done. And I looked right at him and I said, no, I want you to praise God because God has given me the strength, the wisdom, and the knowledge that I need to be able to take this individual where I needed to bring him. And I can say that his family has thanked me as well, but I wanna give the praise to God for giving me the strength to be able to bring this gentleman where he has needed to come, and he has been able to return back to his go on to work. Um, He is wonderful. Um, And all of the individuals in my house, before lunch, before breakfast, before supper, they all wait for one another and they also do prayer. Um, And this one specific individual that was in my emergency drop-in actually will say prayer time. So that warms my heart that um, God has blessed me.